baseball is alive and well on Cestus 3. Jake knows his dad only cooks Hungarian food when he's in a really good mood. And Brunt, FCA, says he got the job at FCA with hard work, bribes, sucking up to the boss, you know, just like any other job. Hey, everybody, <laughs> and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sir Rock Lofton. Hello, hello, hello. My name, wow, we got a bonus hello. This is a special yeah. day. This is feeling yeah, like a next. special day. Uh, was it because of the uh, the baseball is back on Cestus 3? That put me in a good mood. Yeah, it's a regular Cestus pool. <laughs> oh, zip, zip. I was wrong. It's going to be a bad day. <laughs> uh, my name's Ryan T. Husk. By the way, today we are reviewing Deep Space Nine, Season 3, Episode 23, Family Business, Double Entendre, as always with uh, Star Trek and Deep Space Nine. Um, yeah. Titles, always a great one, directed by the late, great, incredible, beautiful Rene Aubergenois and written oh, by wow. our friends Ira Stephen Bear and Robert Hewitt Wolf. Yeah, how cool is that that Rene directed it? I always, when you see directed by one of the actors, you always say, okay, I know that actor is not going to be in this episode very much. And he only had the one scene where he goes, like, but, Cork says, how do you know that? He goes, huh. <laughs> <laughs> how are you man i'm doing good actually i i enjoyed that scene um because of the irony of uh Quark thinking about this his own personal interrogation with his mom and extracting information from her and i thought that was um i i like the way that renee played the irony there like is this guy telling me <laughs> is he saying what i think he's saying right and speaking of which i'm glad you brought that up because uh mm -hmm. our buddy ira bear's middle name is actually me oh okay all right i, I guess it's I, gonna okay be we're both we, we both right, started we, off down let's, here. should we go back back to the top back to the top <laughs> back guys. to one self sealing to the one self <laughs> self something <laughs> Seventh rule, take two. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, I, I did like that. I actually didn't pay attention to the fact that Renee directed the episode. I'm mm -hmm. glad you brought that up. Um, and he did have was just this little bit, a little piece, and so did uh, uh, O'Brien and Bashir. So I'm sure all of those guys really had the week off, and I'm sure we're happy to because, you know, sometimes you get stressed and overworked when you're doing these things. You know, you're right. That is something I hadn't really considered is – they still brought them each in for like one silly little, one silly little scene here or there, just so that they could collect their paycheck and justify it. But really, yeah. they all worked one day, and they had the week off. And you're right, it's probably because, you know, you guys have been slogging through. This is episode twenty three in a season. You guys are probably like, I'll take any day off <laughs> at this point. I'll take any day off. And, and I mean, with the exception of Renee, who actually took the day off, but ends up having to do probably more work. A busier week, yeah. Yeah, the amount of preparation involved with directing, it's, it's a full-time thing. You, there is no uh, a break during the daytime when you're filming, and probably not at night when you're preparing for the next day. So, And in order for those people to get a day off, that means other actors had to do the heavy lifting. And we really get to feature these other actors. Some are regulars or, you know, recurring, and others are first-timers. Uh, but first, let's talk about, because I totally keep forgetting about this, the most important thing to talk about besides this entire episode is that you guys can go ahead and go to patreon.com slash the seventh rule if you'd like to give us a virtual high five, monetarily speaking. Um, or if you don't want to do anything monetarily speaking, just make sure you subscribe to these videos, subscribe to wherever you're watching this, comment in the comment section below, give us a like, share this video, and uh, that will help us a ton because our, uh, boy, our marketing department's on strike lately. So our, we've got this giant <laughs> marketing department and they've been, yeah. we put them, let them, it's actually a vacation. Well, they're dealing with the NFL and the NBA since they came back. So th <laughs> that's their main account. And then we're their third largest account. But, right, right. Yeah. And baseball. Whew. Oh, there's too much yeah. to talk about. Let's stick with what we're talking <laughs> about. The actors that um, that really stepped up and carried this episode, right? Yeah. Uh, and speaking of which, I wanted to ask you about the actor that played the FCA liquidator. Is uh -huh. that, that, that wasn't. 
because my guess was, and I didn't look it up. I I'm think your guessing. guess is going to be Jeffrey right. Combs? Yes, sir. No. Yes. Oh, man. Oh, man. And he totally doesn't, he doesn't look anything like Jeffrey Combs. But, you know, or he doesn't. I mean, I couldn't. I couldn't find any anything that would distinct, you know, any distinction, anything yeah, that would like his eyes I was looking at. Your video froze for like one second, and I was looking forward to seeing your reaction when I said yes, and I, I was, I was, <laughs> it was stolen from me. But how did you figure out it was him? Uh, because of his way of talking, um, just being around him enough. First of all, he's he's a fantastic actor, mm -hmm. and that's the first indicator like this guy's a really good actor like exceptionally good that he's not just a, <laughs> yeah he's not a day player and he's not just a guy that came in for one thing this guy is really really good so that was one thing that i noticed mm -hmm. but then i started to look for things or elements about his facial features to see if that would give it away and I missed him, his name in the credits, so I didn't see that. But I, I did. I started to study his face a little bit. I couldn't find anything that gave it away that it was Jeffrey Combs. I mean, not the eyes, nothing. The cheekbones. There was nothing recognizable. Wow. Yeah, high praise to so, the makeup department there. Then, yeah, the only thing I had to go on was how great a performer he is. And I said, this guy is so good. It's got to be Jeffrey Combs. There's no way. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how I this got is it. it's definitely a fan favorite character. Uh, but Jeff has a lot of fan favorite characters. This is probably his third most popular character. Um, but the top two are, of course, Wayun, who is my favorite. Um, and the other one who I, I think gets more first place votes than even Wayun is Shran, an Andorian character on Enterprise. He kind of plays Captain Archer's foil, and you know, especially for like the fourth season, the entire fourth season. Um, but anyway, yeah, Jeff Combs, doing what Jeff Combs does best, doing a, showing off an acting clinic and calling yeah. it Deep Space Nine. Well, he has certain things in his mannerisms. He takes pauses in certain places, when he's delivering his lines, those were the those pauses kind of gave me a little bit of a hint. Um, his his facial expression, like when he was blocking his face from looking at uh, Works mom, <laughs> yes. the way he did it. He's like, oh he God, it. I can't. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the way he did it, just I was like, that's that that body motion, the movement. That's a Jeffrey Combs move, you know. So he has signature uh, aspects. Of his performance, not just not his face, not his you know, not even his voice, just his performance, his body movements, and the way he delivers lines, uh, right. are are so signature that I, I was able to deduce it just from that. I had I really didn't know he was going to be in this episode. So. You know, it really is like he has his own brand, like the, the Jeffrey Combs brand, which is kind of kind of out there, kind of eccentric but not so far that it's like extreme, just enough to where he can hit completely different characters and totally different angles, but all of them being, you know, very creative in their own way. Like none of them are just like a regular dude. He doesn't play a regular dude. He plays a very interesting character. And the first person that actually opened my eyes to a, being a brand was actually Shaquille O'Neal, which is something totally different. He was talking about himself as a brand. And I realized you're right that like, you know, very good basketball players, very famous or, or great actors, musicians, they have a brand. They start to just say, look, this is my yeah. brand. This is my company. This is what I uh, represent. And Jeff Combs definitely does, I think. He's a really talented man and uh, really a good person when you get to know him and talk with him. He's, he's such a pleasant person to be around. Um, but yeah, he, he did a fantastic job as this, you know, IRS agent. Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> collecting inventory. I, I like the pauses. I, for example, the first pause he did, which I really enjoyed, was when Quark was asking about, you know, do you have an inventory of what, what it is? And he just kind of looked, he did one of these look backs, like, 
if you pay me, <laughs> but he didn't say it. <laughs> he didn't say it. And, you know, eventually Cork understood it to say, oh, yeah, I have to bribe you. But um, so, yeah, that, you know, I couldn't can't say enough about Jeffrey Combs. He's just a really great guy. Yeah. And um, we also got to see uh, the Ferengi homeworld. I think, was this the first time we gotten to see it uh, so far in Deep Space Nine? And, and so. you know, I love to see, I love it when they expand our knowledge of a certain race. Like we saw the Trill homeworld in that fantastic episode that wasn't fantastic. Oh, um, yeah. The oh, one yeah, where really... they're in the milky water and like little worms are squirming between their legs or whatever. Um but you know, and then we see Cardassia, which was a great one when uh, was it? Miles goes over there, and then we get to see the Klingon homeworld when Quark goes over to Mary Grilka, um, and now we get to see Ferenginar and all of their just outrageous customs and their like. We already think they're weird when they're on the station, but to see them amongst themselves, where everything is about money, like. You know, can I have a seat? Oh, that's three. That's three strips of Latin. Mm -hmm. He goes, I'll just stand. He goes, that's one strip of Latin. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> cost you a, a buck just to stand. Yeah. Just to stand. Yeah. Uh, remind me of being on an airline these days. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, um, we got to see the world. You know, I noticed that the arches in the doorway were even low for Ferengi, and I thought that was kind of a an architectural. Thing that they did where they had these really low doorway arches that even mm -hmm. Quark had to duck underneath. Right, it. I noticed that too, yeah. I was just saying, well, that must maybe they evolved from an even shorter species, you know, <laughs> even if, maybe they were shorter even before. But I, I like to, to see their home world, I like to see their customs. Um, I thought this episode really did something that, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think in the documentary, Ira was talking about the check different things that he felt like ds9 checked off right yeah, they addressed that. racism right they addressed uh sexuality they, they addressed a lot of these different uh, topics and he went through and very uh smartly checked off things that he did touch on or maybe even expanded on and this one for me would fall under the category of um women's rights you know right um it's under that umbrella for me yeah, especially because they went so, so extreme with it. Like, completely outrageous, impossible, baffling, ridiculous, extreme with it. But then, when you stop and think about it, you say, well, it was pretty bad 50 years ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. Like, it makes you say, well, this is really extreme, but... We were pretty bad a few decades back. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like absolutely. if this, like this, if this was done, you know, in the fifties or in the the twenties, you know, nineteen twenties, it wouldn't land the same way because they'd be like, "What's the big deal? <laughs> yeah, cool, <laughs> women don't wear clothes. Awesome." <laughs> She's supposed to be cooking. Um, so yeah, there would be a whole lot of stereotypes that we would that wouldn't really land the way they did um and when they it wasn't as absurd i mean i guess having her naked all the time is is the real major absurdity but um yeah because we don't you know they were you wouldn't necessarily want your wife going to the grocery store naked right or or inviting inviting friends over your wife inviting friends over for a couple drinks naked or things like you'd be like mm, mm, maybe you can have some clothes i guess yeah, um, but there were other aspects like, you know, where she says, you know, she has an opinion on things or she's talking when she shouldn't be talking. Those are kinds of concepts that, that actually uh, did exist. Totally. Or, you know, in our culture, which is, you know, very sad to say. Um, but, you know, this would fall under that particular category. I thought it was um, really good to see. Um, Rom and Quark as brothers. Mm -hmm. um, usually, even though they are brothers on the station, 
because Ram has a subservient role to his bigger brother, it felt as it feels as though he's like the dad almost, you know, or or something else. It just doesn't feel you don't really see the dynamic underneath the umbrella of the mother or mm -hmm. a parental figure. So um, I like to see that. I like to hear the backstory about their father and, and you know, um, their genetics, their where they come from. So I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, and they definitely did act like siblings when they're rolling around on the ground and pulling on each other's ears and just wrestling around like two little stinkers. Um, and you, you definitely see the the Rom and Moogie uh, love, you know, where he's all he's like putting his head on her naked lap and just nuzzling around in there, and and, and I kind of noticed that like Rom he kind of sings when he says Moogie. He doesn't just say like Moogie and stretched out, but he kind of goes like Moogie. You know, he just, yeah. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, it's almost like he's singing out there for a little while, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah. but, and as we know, he does sing. Um, so I wonder if that's kind of plays into part of what he does, at least his vocal delivery. I think so. And I think it's pretty, uh, it just, it's, it's great because it's he just makes his whole he creates this whole you know uh, nickname thing where it makes it just feel like it's personal to him. Um, I really liked his performance in this. I liked him stepping up to Quark and kind of standing up to him and slapping him around like, hey, you know, can't you see what's going on? Yeah, and uh, you know. I also wanted to say that the woman that played Moogie had a few moments that I thought were pretty special. I liked her, the way her eyes uh, would light up in certain moments and she would convey so much emotion with her eyes. Right, Andrea Martin. Um, now, this was when uh, watching these scenes, I couldn't help but picture, you know, what, what Armin and, and Aaron would always talk about where they would they would get together on the weekend and they would practice their scenes. I think they would go to Armin's place. I think that's what it was. And they they probably did that almost every week, you know, with whatever scenes Armin was doing. Um, but this was probably a very heavy weekend for them because they had like three fourths of the scenes. And I can't help but just picture those days because they talk about them fondly. And just picturing uh, Max and Armin and Andrea and Jeff Combs all getting together, probably in the valley somewhere, and you know uh, at Armin's place, and just going over everything, having a few laughs. You know, um, Andrea's probably saying since it's her one of her first times, she's saying like, "Hey, how about if I do it like this? What do you think?" And they're just like, "Oh my God, brilliant!" Because she did a great job. And so I'm sure they were, when they were rehearsing together, they were probably very happy with it. They were probably like, oh, this is going to be great, you know? And it's just fun to, to picture that camaraderie that they must have had working on these things together. Yeah, the same thought crossed my mind. I thought about those uh, rehearsals at Armin's place, and I felt like a lot of the uh, beats were already timed out between the actors. They knew what they wanted to get done, which probably made it a whole hell of a lot easier for Renee. Exactly. On the directing side, right? He's like, all right, you guys already know what you're going to do. And I'll just, <laughs> I'll just light it and set it up. Um, and there were beats there that I wanted to bring up, too, that I thought were non-scripted beats. Oh, cool. Um, for example, <clears throat> when Quark is headed to the airlocks and he's about to leave to go see his mom and work this whole thing out, Rom comes running up behind him and says, hey, I'm going with you, brother, you know? <laughs> and um, Quark tries to talk him out of it, but then finally agrees. He says, all right, fine, you're coming. But that whole scene, Quark had a, sh a bag over his shoulder. That was his little duffel bag to go. And at the end of the scene, they finish their exchanges, and Quark's like, all right, fine, you can come. And the bag... He takes off and throws it to Cor to Rom like you carry this, right? <laughs> like he's his porter. <laughs> yeah, and I felt like that was a natural. I don't feel. I, I don't know if that was scripted. I felt like that's something that Armin would just do. Like, yeah, I feel like that's something that Armin would just say. You know what? Here, you take this. 
since you're coming now you got to hold this and he's uh, so armin's like renee what do you think of this and he plays it and then renee goes huh i like it keep it <laughs> i like <exactly>. it armin <laughs> i like it yes so 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 that was one of the the beats that i felt like uh that was just them working out so much timing, having so much rhythm and, and just like he could, he can create that on the fly. And, you know, there was, a, it just felt like it was created on the fly. If you watch it again, the way the bag is holding it almost like he realizes at the last second, like, Oh yeah, here, take this. Mm. So I may be wrong, but I just feel like that's one thing that, you know, they added just because they had so much chemistry and it worked out all the timing. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. And I do try to catch things where I wonder, was that an actor's choice or was that a, a director's note or was that just written into the script? Um, and because it's always that trifecta of possibilities. Um, and most of the time, I'll never know. I ask you and sometimes, you know, other times we're just like, well, maybe it was probably Avery <laughs> is what we usually say. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, you know, yeah, exactly. Sometimes you'll know. If you can remember in the details of this, you know, the subscript of the of the script. So that's not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I made a, a note of Moogie's earrings because I just thought the way the earrings came down and connected in the middle like necklaces was kind of an interesting uh, <laughs> a wardrobe choice for, for the guys. Yeah, they've got some peculiar uh, jewelry on Ferenginar, I guess. They do. They do, but I did like the outfits that they were wearing. I think Quark might be the best dressed, if not, you know, one of the best dressed characters. <laughs> Yikes. He just has all these layers in this. I mean, he's really got nice outfits. And Rom as well had some pretty decent outfit wardrobe changes in this one. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the dress that Moogie was wearing. It's kind of this, you know, hip, colorful, looks like cocktail dress from the 50s that that was all studded out and a little bit baggier, but I liked it. Yeah, uh, I looked on IMDb, and that was actually Andrea's only time playing Moogie, apparently. Um, and the other actress, I can't remember her name at the moment, must have taken over from there, but I don't know why they got a different actress to play her later on. You wouldn't happen to know, would you? No, that, that part I don't know. One thing did jump out at me was that I felt like she was a little bit young. As you could tell underneath that prosthetics that she was uh, probably younger than Quark. And, a young and, buck. And, yeah. Yeah, or at least the same age as them. So it didn't, it didn't register that she was an older woman underneath the manga. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Interesting. So we're going to go to our break in a hot juicy second do want to tell you that we'll have the trivioids on the other side we also have a few nams to go over i'm sure you caught caught some nams some very very important nams those are non-appearance mentions um also a quick shout out to our good friend mr muhammad Noor, who is one of our newest associate producers and is helping out a ton with the upcoming virtual trek con so shout out to our buddy mr muhammad Noor. The nice. Dean of Natural Sciences at Duke University. I can't talk anymore. We should have just taken a break at Duke University. <laughs> 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 and uh, he's also a star, uh, science consultant for Star Trek, but he can't tell you anything about it until it's all over. No, no juicy tidbits from him. Um, anyway, no spoilers. No spoilers. Yeah, nothing. So we're going to come right back on the other side on The Seventh Rule. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name's Ryan T. Esk. We're reviewing Family Business, Season 3, Episode 23 of Deep Space Nine. And very quickly, the, there are a lot of pretty good trivioids. Uh, Cisco correctly identifies Rom's lock as a tripartite as a tripartite micro-sealing mechanism. I wonder how many times he had to practice that. Jake guesses that Cisco has convinced the Pelgenites to exchange ambassadors with the Federation, and he's right. Uh, Cisco only cooks Hungarian food when he's in a really good mood. We know that one. Rom gave Nog the night off for his Starfleet exams. 
that was that was the one I wanted to have up there. Uh, Brunt says he got the FCA job. We know that one. Moogie took a part of Quark's monthly stipend and invested in Hupyrian Beetle Farm. Uh, Hardshea needs to stop being an idiot and get an anti-grav sled before he hurts himself. That's what Cassidy Yates told him, uh, which is we're bearing the lead here. Not talking about Cassidy Yates yet. Uh, when you're working with the Patarians, you have to make do with what they give you. That's another KY, Cassidy Yates. I shouldn't say KY. Uh, Cassidy's <laughs> youngest brother is a colonist on Cestus III. There's a lot of really good stuff to cover. Let's, let's jump into the Cassidy Yates. Finally, finally, Cassidy has finally. returned to Deep Space Nine. Yeah, finally, she's, she's here. And, yeah. um, Jake's been doing a lot of gossiping and spreading the rumor. <laughs> yes, he has. He has been going around telling everybody that it's going down. Mm -hmm. so it's funny I, because know. it's such a Ferengi-centric episode, but really the biggest part of that episode, I think, was the introduction of Cassidy Yates. We know in hindsight. Right. It is the biggest part. And, you know, it's... It's kind of like this is this is another example of the serialization of what what Ira is doing and how they bringing up you know stories and continuing the storylines into the next episode. So we have this flow and this ebb where it's constantly feels like you're watching it the next day in the life or the you know a couple of days later. Um, and you know I really like Cassidy's uh, whole introduction into this episode. Uh, just about the, the talk about the gossip before she gets there, the building up of her coming. But I also like the fact that she's a freighter <laughs> captain and that she's kind of a person in charge herself. So exactly. she, you know, she has her own level of authority that she brings to the table. She's not like fawning over Commander Cisco, like, oh, well, you know, you're the boss. Right. Uh, she's got a whole backpack full of I don't need you, right, on, slung over her shoulder. Right. Right, and I like that about her. And actually, yeah. I think Cisco finds that attractive about her. You know, she's like, "Yeah, I can do this. I, you know, I I got this. Um, like I've been doing this way before I met you. I just met you a second ago. <laughs> so I'm not the damsel in distress. I'm not the oh, I yeah. need a big I be, need a big strong man to come over here and help me lift this thing up." Um, so I like that about her, her confidence, her independence. I like that she's in a position of authority, um, and that she's also, um, attractive, but not overly, uh, sexy sexualized. And, yeah. yeah. Sexualized. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So those are the, all the, the real positives and pluses I think that Penny Johnson brings to this, uh, brings to this, this character. She brings a level of class. Uh, sophistication, um, intelligence, and I, I and I like the also the matching of wits with Cisco. There's there's points where she's like right back on top of him. Uh, right. You know this this is not a you know this is not a level seven uh, you know uh, <laughs> transporter. You know I've got a, a the, the, the version five. You know it actually sounded like an <laughs> iPhone. When people compare their iPhones, like, oh, I got the iPhone 11. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, she also had this air about her that we also like, which is she kind of lights up a room. And I'm not sure if it's a, a, an energy kind of thing, but physically speaking, she's got these very beautiful, expressive eyes and she's got this amazing smile. You know, she has this smile to, when the smile happens, you kind of can't help but feel yourself also, your, your, your cheeks are kind of spreading too, you know? And so I think beyond all of the, the internal stuff, physically speaking, she also has a very loving demeanor. She has this demeanor where you want to know her, you want to love her, you want to talk to her. She seems like she's a great person, you know? Um, at least that's what what comes through to me, and I've as and I've never met the actress. Uh, and the other thing uh, related to that is on Cisco's part. Let's not let's not forget that he does go to meet her. I'd forgotten that. I just assumed 
that they, Jake kept saying, oh, you should meet my dad and, or, and oh, you should meet Cassidy. She's great. And then the, and I assumed that they just kind of bumped into each other and were like, oh, hey, I guess we're supposed to meet each other. But no, Cisco actually said to himself, okay, I'll go meet this girl. Cause he went to her to speak with her. I thought that was pretty cool. I did too. And I actually like the way that it came up the, the scene prior to that, which is where O'Brien's, you know, he's talking with <laughs> O'Brien and he says, yeah, O'Brien, if you need any help, I'll be. And he says, yeah, you'll be over there by cargo. It's like, no. I mean, maybe, but no, <laughs> no. Why would I be over there? He's like, Oh, I thought you'd be seeing that uh, Cassidy. Um, so I, I like the setup to that as well. Um, but yeah, he takes the initiative. He he finally, you know, he hears it from enough places. I think there was also another moment that was kind of special between Dax and Cisco, where Dax says, you know, um, if I was Curzon, I would have stole her from you already, or something to that effect, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, which that was our Cisco first. Know. That was yeah. our first hint that this was a character that was going to stick around for a while. Right. Right. Also a hint that it was going to be somebody that was compatible with Cisco, right? Because that's his taste. It's somebody that would be up his, his speed, for example. So, um, uh, you know, I like those kinds of moments. They were small moments, but they also, um, they, they lighten up Cisco's relationship with the, with the crew as well, right? It's like, hey, mm -hmm. uh, there's a girl that likes you or there's somebody out here for you. It's, it's, it takes it to a more playful place and allows them to grow like a, a different kind of bond um, between each other as characters. Hmm. Yeah, so it was great to see her and we know that it, it goes well from there. But what especially made me happy was the direction that their conversation went later where Cisco is just like, oh my God, baseball is being played on Cestus three. And she's like, yeah, for like the last six months, he's like, he's like how any of us would be. How many teams are there? Six. What, do they use the designated hitter? No, they thought about it. What, what kind of bats are they? Well, just like, I got to see this. What's going on, man. There's baseball. Do they, do they need a right headed pitcher? He's like, I still got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was fun. I really, I, I like that a lot. Probably. I like that probably more than I should have. Cause I have a feeling that Ira really pushed for that. Cause I know Ira, right. Ira's a big baseball fan. Yeah. But it's also, I think what they really highlighted in that moment, cause it felt like it wasn't going as well as it should between right. them originally. And I think that happens in, in most cases when you are meeting somebody for the first time and you're trying to, you know, build a connection and find common interests. And sometimes there's pauses and awkward pauses where you're like, okay, I guess, uh, I guess it's not going to go farther than I think it is. And then you'll like, you know, like talk about something random, like, Hey, you watch game of Thrones or something, you know, and, it's like, hey, okay. and then there it is. It's like the one thing that opens it all up. It's like, Oh my God, you're a Star Trek fan. I went to creation. I did this. I go to conventions. Da, 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 da. And now you're found out that your whole worlds are exactly alike as opposed to a second ago when you thought there's nothing that we have in common. This is not going to go well. This conversation yeah. is going to be boring. So I like that baseball was the thing that opened that, you know, Pandora's box up for them. Yeah, that was beautiful. That was awesome. And it also, it also just made me happy as a sports fan to know that like if baseball ended, you know, around what, 2150 or something they just stopped playing and then 200 years later one of the plants started playing it again i'm like that's that's like a happy ending to me you know like mm -hmm. to some people they watch they're like okay that's funny or that's cute but to me i'm like it's a happy ending for baseball <laughs> it makes me feel better that you know right right i don't know if it'll ever end but we like our sports and uh sports do a lot of cool things it's exciting <laughs> Yeah, uh, the other thing that I thought of instantly, kind of, I don't know why this came to my mind when I was watching it, but I was thinking uh, Cisco really needs to join some some uh, Facebook groups or something so he, <laughs> so, so he can find out what's going on in, yeah. the, uh, 
you know, in the quadrant around him because clearly they've been playing baseball for six months and he had no idea. Yeah, join the Cestus Comets Pioneers Facebook page, man. Like, what are you doing? The, yeah. Or the, the Pike City Pioneers and the Cestus yeah. Comets. They're the Pike City Pioneers. Yeah. So you would think that there would be some way to find that out. And if you, you'd get an alert on your phone or something like, bing, bing, something you're interested in is uh, not too far away. <laughs> it's just all the way in <laughs> Cestus 3. Yeah. So... Um, I thought that was kind of uh, a fun. I don't know why I thought of social media and why he he would need to. It's because adapt. you're a social media addict, Sirak. We well, all know how active you are. <laughs> I don't. I don't like to brag. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, so we we only have about 15 minutes left, but there's just so much to cover that I want to make sure that we also talk about the Nams. We had a Nam for our superstar, Mr. Aaron Eisenberg. Uh, you yeah. know, they mentioned that, you know, Quark says, where's, where's Nog? And Rom says, like, I gave him the day off to study for Starfleet exams or whatever he says. Uh, yeah. So that was cool. That gave us a nice little picture of him just lying on his bed, all studious, you know, combing his little ear hair and studying <laughs> for his exams. Yeah, I, I liked it, too. He also said. He wants to work better hours. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. And he thought that was so funny. He was very proud of his joke there. Yeah, he was very proud of his joke right there. Um, and, and, and the other thing that I liked is uh, Quark's reaction to not going to Starfleet. He, he went on for a little miniature, you know, uh, rampage where he was, he was not happy about it. He, he called it the end of the Ferengi as we know it. You know, not going to, not going to Starfleet is the end of the Ferengi as yeah. we know it. I, that was just a little, a little <laughs> extra on there. A little, a little extra, yeah. They, uh, yeah. He definitely thought it was something big, big news because he was just like, cats and dogs living together, what's next? It's going to be insane. <laughs> uh, we also got to see, uh, not to jump around too much, but that does remind me that on the, the Ferengi homeworld, all the rain that was going on, we're always talking about the rain and so how every time they came in and out they're always like oh. it, it, it's like you would think that they'd be prepared every time they stepped out it was almost like ah shoot it's raining what ah, don't they have yeah. why don't they just <laughs> have an, a, a permanent umbrella or like yeah. have an umbrella hat for their giant fat heads like come on dude it's always raining on Ferenginar. how are you not prepared how is nobody in that capitalist society invented umbrellas <laughs> or something <laughs> come on something something you would think uh, and they're always like wow it's raining <laughs> yeah it's always raining <laughs> yeah you know just like every single day ever we also got a nam for stole or stall i think it was stole that was a uh, quark's cousin now i don't know if that really is much of a, a nam i don't remember if he ever gets mentioned again um I feel like it's mentioned once that uh, I don't know. Yeah, but, I didn't and, pay attention to that one. And also Keldar. Keldar gets a few nams because that's Quark's dad. Because some like when uh when Quark went to marry uh Grilka, he said, you know, Quark, son of Keldar, you know. Right. But we never see Keldar, and I don't know if we ever know much more about him than today's episode, but he does get mentioned a few times. Yeah, a little backstory on the dad. Obviously not a, a good uh, businessman, by the mom's standards at least. Oh, and we also talked maybe last week or the week before about different openings, you know. And we did mention how it would be cool to have an opening between Jake and his dad, and we got that today. So that was cool. It was really nice to see Cisco humming his tunes. Good voice, by the way. Uh, making yeah. some... Hungarian food called a uh, chicken paprikash. Papra, paprikash. Paprikash. So that, that's what S Jake said, but then Cisco corrected him. He said paprikash. Paprikash, paprikash, you know, tomato, tomato. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if that has to do with paprika or, or what the deal is there. But Hungarian food, that's, that's today's yeah. quiz is Hungarian food, of course. <laughs> there was a bunch of yo mama jokes in this episode 
your mama wears clothes. <laughs> <laughs> your mama talks to strangers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> they could have, they should, it's had a bunch of your mama jokes. Your mama's so dumb, she makes a bunch of money. Huh. Then gets audited by the FDA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so this is a lot of Yo Mama jokes. But you know, there was also another, there was a couple of moments there. Um, when Quark was explaining the whole thing about, you know, this, uh, I think, um, you know, about the rules of tradition and how women are functioning in Ferengi society. And those were, there were a lot of discussion about that. And in between the two, with the mom and Quark, uh, Mugi says something like, this, is, this society could use a little more chaos, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, <clears throat> yeah, and, and I just like the arguments. I like the way she was defending herself and defending her position. Like, what's wrong with a woman doing this? Why can't I wear clothes? You know, the, uh, she was making her arguments valid and, to, and to, to the point where I almost wish that Quark turned her into the FCA and caused some sort of court action or whatever that eventually changed the culture for like a high profile uh suit. Yeah. yeah that's a good point yeah like it goes to the supreme court and eventually she it's like you know it's one of the cases that changes where they the think they think culture. it's cut and dry but then right. all all the women are kind of like kind of secretly rooting for her and then not so secretly rooting for her. And then it makes people kind of think about it and be like, well, I mean, just think if women also have the lobes to do this business, we could double the amount of people. <laughs> right. that are, why would we even hold them down in the first place? Exactly. So I, I was almost wishing that this episode went in that direction where they made the argument, they made the case that women should have the same equality as, as the men in Ferengi, uh, um, so, that, uh, so that there was some kind of change culturally for them. At least the, 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 the dam breaking, that we can see that there was, you know, just a little bit of break in the norm, and that maybe the Grand Nagus or somebody started to perceive it a little bit differently. And I think that would have been the beginning of the kind of revolution that could help <laughs> the Ferengi women um, have their freedoms and, and have their liberty. You know, that's a great point. Um, that would be very interesting. And that is something that Star Trek would do and has been known to do. Um, that, that's really great. I wonder if they had considered that. I mean, there, there is more of that kind of stuff later on in Deep Space Nine. And I think this episode was more about introducing that situation and that character and just kind of like how it's going to you know it's kind of like that seed that that starts everything because you know as we talk about the serialized thing it's it's much more a, of a large scale event to do in, into one episode usually they'll do like that kind of thing in one episode when it's like a race we've never heard of you know they, they land mm -hmm. on some planet the kids are playing hacky sack in the corner of the courtyard and these people say it's just the way we've always done things. You know, and Bashir goes, but that's not fair, you know? <laughs> and then he, he fights and, you know, and Chief O'Brien's like, don't worry about it, Julian, or whatever. And eventually they all rise up and, and change. And it's all because, because Julian was right, that it's not fair or whatever, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but when it's something as big as Ferenginar, they, they're spreading it out over multiple seasons uh right to give it you know more the the attention it deserves especially one that's this important this kind of uh issue yeah um and then i understand that most of this was really about the family dynamic and, and that's why you know family business hence the name um but it was really about how quark rom and his mom have their relationship so they didn't want to take it too far and make it about uh, women's rights issue in Ferenginar, but it could have gone that way or at least started to go in that direction. Oh yeah. And it definitely, um, it definitely highlighted it a lot. I mean, yeah, absolutely. This was a, this was a, a women's rights kind of episode, but just within the smaller scale of this one family for now, but it'll definitely grow. You're right.
Yeah. And to and to complement that, they also showed a strong, powerful, uh, opinionated woman in Cassidy Yates. Right. So mm, in point. this in this episode, they introduced two very strong and 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 uh, courageous women who are willing to stand up for their own uh, for themselves and for their beliefs. So you I know, like I that. I hadn't thought of that. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, both both of them. So that's I mean, it's it's a nice touch. Uh, um, and they often do that where there's some sort of relation between the, the A story, B story. Um, and this one, this one, I felt like that was the common ground. The two of them were, you know, both independent, strong women that, that had their own vision of what they wanted to accomplish. I wanted to just really quickly say something about uh, Rom's line. I loved it a lot that it just made me laugh out loud. And that was when he said, and no shouting. Yeah, I wrote that know. down too. He goes, and no shouting. I'm going to go take a nap. <laughs> yeah. And I laughed so hard on that one. I thought it was, I just thought that was funny. Um, he had a couple of good lines in this one, but that was one of them. It just made me just, just say, this guy, Max, is so good at, he's so good at this uh, Rom character, right? Right. It's a big, <laughs> big shout out to Max Grudenshik. Yes. And I feel yeah. like he's another one, we, we've said this before, but he's another one of those characters where the the writers probably thought, okay, we'll have him in a few episodes here and there. And then they just realized that they struck gold. They're like, this guy is so fun. Such a fun character created by this actor that, you know, when that happens, you kind of force the writers to say, okay, well, let's write him in more stuff because we this is gold here, you know? Yeah, he's he is gold. Um, and you know, this interesting thing to me too. Um, even though we've seen elements of Max of, of Max's character Rom stealing from his brother and and kind of aspiring to be a little bit rich and stuff, you didn't see that in this episode. I mean, he could have easily said, you know, to his mom, "Hey, we've got money. I don't need to work for you, brother. I quit. Mom's rich." You know, something to that degree. Uh, but you could see that he, you could see that money wasn't the thing that was motivating him the most. And maybe totally. once again, once again, that was, uh, that was proof that Moogie's words that Ram is like the father is, is the truth. Like, you know, the father doesn't really, it doesn't have the lobes for business. He doesn't have the lobes for wanting to get money. And, and Ram doesn't, didn't seem to have the lobes for wanting money in this episode. That's an interesting point because that makes me automatically think apparently Quark takes after his mom. The visionary, the right. one with the lobes, the one that is willing to take risks, you know? You're right. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. And she outsmarted the FCA in the same way that Quark outsmarted the FCA. Like, you know, I see he said, uh, you know it's against the the law if you don't tell me about all your assets. And then Quark mentioned the tulaberry wine. Rom, go get the tulaberry wine. How come you didn't? How come you didn't report them what you told me? <laughs> you know, uh, tulaberry wine. That was the very first step into the Dominion, if I remember correctly. And the, well, the the Gamma Quadrant, more like they were trying to open up trade. You know, with a tulaberry wine into the Gamma Quadrant, right? right? That's what that was, right? I love it when right. they take us back. Remind I us. I love it when they drop a little nugget like that, and they, they almost always do. And that's once again indicative of the serialization and how they they don't let things stay in one you know episode. They they carry them over. There was also one. Uh, we've only got a minute left, but there was also one final thing I wanted to bring up just very quickly of like the the silly lines when Mugi uh, Ishka takes off her clothes. She's like fine, and. Uh, she takes off her clothes. Rom's like, please, Moogie, please mm -hmm. take off your clothes. And she's like, okay, Rom. And she takes them off. She's like, better. And he goes, much. <laughs> like, what is going on around here? Like, what, what's happening? Yeah, that, it, it was, that, that is hard for us to visualize because of that's just how we grew up in our own culture. Most people in the world, I think, have not do not hang out with their mom when she's naked. So and I mean, beg her to take off her clothes. Yeah. So that's that's hard to swallow for a lot of us, but it's it's just it is a funny little thing that they played. Mm. Um, 
real quickly, I want to shout out to the Rubicon. Uh, I think they were naming one of the uh, ships, and Cisco said, "Call it the Rubicon." Yeah. And the response was, "Good thing that the there's a plenty of rivers, rivers or something." Yeah. Like, yeah. So just a little shout out and to that little mention right there. I, I like that. That was a fun one uh, because then I kind of thought about. It. I was like, "Oh yeah, that's right." There's like the Ganges, and they they've named a bunch of others, you know. And you go, "Okay, okay, that's cool." Like uh, yeah. every series seems to have kind of its thing that it names their ships after as we know the lower decks right now is all is all just cities in california right deep space nine right. liked uh like the rivers right the pacoima <laughs> coming <Yikes>. soon <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Uh, uh, so we're just about out of time here before we forget Let's give a quick shout out to our favorite people, Miss Carmen Shamwell, PJ Thomas, TJ Jackson Bay, Bill Victor Arukin, Arukin, Yvette Blackman, Dennis Koch, Homer Frizzell, Eve England, Anne Marie Siegel, Titus Moeller, Tim Baum, Mr. Dr. Mohammed Noor, Susan B. Gruner, Rex A. Wood, Wood. and uh a lot of them are going to be joining us for the free for all next. And we hope that you guys join us for the free for all next as well. Do you have any final thoughts? Uh, no, I just, just really happy to see that we've got Cassidy on board now. And that was, that's the beginning of her, right. her journey on the show and just welcoming her aboard. And I'm excited to see um, how she's going to soften Cisco up and change uh, what we see with Cisco. So I'm excited about that. Also, um, there are very few episodes in which Cisco has a goatee and hair. So really soak these episodes up, guys, because there's like, I think there are like three or four of them or something. I don't really remember exactly, but I remember there's a very brief moment in time, you know, or as yeah. Whitney Houston says, one moment in time. Yes, that's what she says. Oh, I was hoping you would <laughs> sing it. I was like, is he going to sing it for me? I love that uh, song. Uh, I'm not singing it, though, but I do uh, love that song. I, I would tear that song up. You uh, got to do something easier for me, like Vanilla Ice or something. <laughs> I can't do with the Houston. <laughs> All right. Uh, Give me what? No, I'm not going to do it either. I'm going to destroy it. Uh, all right, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see on the other side on the free for all, guys. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule free for all with Sirach Lofton. Yeah, hello. <laughs> We've got Mr. Muhammad Noor. I'm sorry I always say Mr. I meant Dr. Muhammad Noor. Mr. is true, too. <laughs> or um, Mr. Doctor. Yeah, that's what I always end up saying. I go, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Uh, Commander Homer Frizzell, TJ Jackson Bay, hey. Timothy Baum. And Susan B. Gruner, how are y'all? Also a doctor. Doc, Dr. <laughs> yes. Susan B. Gruner. Yes. Howdy. <laughs> so first things first, let's uh, do the old t-shirt show off, starting with Homer. <laughs> Homer, show oh, us yeah. your shirt. So uh, from the Seven Thrill Shop, this is Ferengi Eyes. There they are. I thought it appropriate, given the episode is Ferengi-centric. Though there is yeah. another story as well. It's quite awesome. Let's hear it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Jake wanted to introduce his father to a freighter captain, and it happens in this episode. Stay tuned. Actually, no. You guys have already <laughs> talked about it. So uh, I really, really hope you enjoyed the heck out of that. <laughs> yeah. Great background. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sue, what about you? You had a pretty awesome shirt you showed us a second yes, ago. Can you show us again? I have to admit, it is awesome. Okay, it's a take up on the birth of Venus. So you can see Uhura in there. And the back is way cool. Wow. Oh. That is a very cool shirt. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I like the patterns. I like the colors. It's really cool. If they make that without the V-neck, for men, I think I, I, I'd get one of those. Sure. But can I say where? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I got it on Etsy, but I'm, I think it's 
they have a, ma a male version as well. It took a month for me to get it. So I think they're making them maybe individually. Okay. I'm not sure. Maybe it's a order. To find it. Well, that's your first piece of Star Trek uh, yes. clothing, uh, right? I've ordered stuff from your shop and I've ordered some other, I like funky different things. So I've ordered some other weird, not usual, the usual, the usual Star Trek. Thing. If you like I'm funky hard things. Time finding, <laughs> finding like a uniform from uh, the next generation. I'm, I think I was oh. talking to Homer on Facebook about it. It is really hard finding good quality stuff. Yeah. So I'm going That's for the true. retro funky instead. <laughs> yeah, you almost have to know somebody to get a good uniform. It's true. Like eBay is where, where people get a lot of them or at, at conventions. Are right. they good quality ones that you can get at conventions? They're expensive, but yeah. Yeah. You that can company, get, uh, Aina, is, what is it called? At the Lovos. Yeah, but there are yeah. some of the ones that are, I mean, they're, I, I've never even, tried one on because i saw the prices <laughs> yeah. yeah but but, that, but it is top quality though i mean I, yeah those I, are I, screen worthy aren't they yeah 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 they usually have a booth at the convention so you can yeah. see most of their stuff you know in person and get to feel and touch the fabric and their stuff is legit mm -hmm. it's um as far as as far as uniforms are concerned i think they're about as good as it gets basically yeah, in starfleet I, I have a couple they're awesome Really? Which yeah, ones do you have? Yeah, got some really cool ones. Okay, Ryan, so now if you ask me that question, you'll find out that I have more than a couple. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, what about, what about Tim asked the question? <laughs> no, I think the answer would be the same. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna lie, even though a couple, I guess, probably was already. But I, I started out with TOS, and I have the velour of uh, the three divisions. Uh, I have a Picard. I have a, an enterprise uh, jacket that I got on eBay. And then they also do these shore leave shirts. So you can get like a Captain Picard, um, but it's got short sleeves. You know, it's kind mm -hmm. of like throwback to the 1970s when they made the, like the green Captain Kirk shirt on the animated mm -hmm. series. Mm -hmm. So I have that one too. Then also the command gold one. Uh, so maybe I have, Eight or nine, ten. <laughs> Price uh, tag, schmice tag. <laughs> well, it's. I figure you know you buy something, it's amortized, or the the flip is like you buy a bunch of things over a long period of time. It's so true. it's kind of like amortizing too. Right, right. Sounds so like you a just go out one day and buy ten uniforms. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. Hey Tim, uh, we missed what you said nice earlier because you were still muted. Uh, what did you say something earlier that? Uh, oh no, I just uh, you know he said uh, amortization, and I said it sounds more like a rationalization. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <Shots> Tim. Fired. <laughs> and I, it's it's an ization, okay? okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's an ization. You could say the same thing about me in Liverpool jerseys, so yeah. <laughs> Is that what that's you have true. today? Yeah, this is uh, the the away jersey from last year. Wow, can uh, we see wow. it? Uh huh. Nice. And I got my name on the back. I don't know if you can see that. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So yeah, it's I, uh, probably about the same as a Novos. Yeah. Oh, the new Nike jerseys this year it cost me one hundred and sixty five dollars. Yeah, sports. Sports uniforms and jerseys are are hardcore. Uh, for me, my guilty pleasure is basketball jerseys. Uh, uh, Ciroc, you probably have a few too. Those are a pretty penny, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I have a few. I, I, I actually used to collect the, you know, back in the Michael Jordan days. I have my Michael Jordan home and away, and the forty-five jersey, and all the jerseys that he had, but. Then I started to just collect my own jerseys. At some point, I was playing enough basketball where I would get my own jersey. So nice. I have a significant collection of my own jerseys. Like like Tim has his own name on the back. So it's pretty <laughs> cool. 
Do you, do you have like a most embarrassing uh, jersey of like a player that you thought was going to be really good and he turned out to not end up being great? Or was it just all Jordan? Uh, no, I, I stuck with Jordan, uh, Shaq. I only have Jordan, Shaq, and uh, Kobe. No Dennis Rodman. <laughs> uh, I didn't get a, I didn't get a Dennis Rodman jersey. I didn't get I didn't get any other players. Like, it was only the the Jordan jersey really. I only bought the Shaq jerseys because I was a friend of Shaq's and I was hanging out with him for a while, so I wanted nice. him to sign him. So the, the Shaq jerseys I have are all signed by him, and I I won't wear it. So yeah, they're just they're just sitting there. But no Brian yeah. Shaw jerseys. Yeah. No, 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 no. More. No jerseys. <laughs> All right. So today we uh, reviewed a cool and fun Ferengi episode, as Homer well knows. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many of you have seen it recently, but it was it was a great one uh, because it brought up, you know, like uh, struggles of, of women's rights through the lens of the Ferengi, which is like uber magnified. <laughs> like, uh, and it's, it, you know, they they really go outrageous with it, but it makes their it's to make their points. You know, it's really interesting to make us kind of review our own history. Uh, we also had Cassidy Yates, finally a first episode for her, so that was really exciting. And as Sirach pointed out, this episode kind of had the, the the formation of two strong female characters, which was Cassidy Yates and Ishka. Um, so that's kind of what this episode was about it was a really fun one so um i don't know how many of you have seen the episode recently i looked at it today oh cool i was prepared <laughs> sue did you nice. have any uh thoughts on the episode did you like it did you love it did you want more of it i've always liked it because it actually it's actually it's actually relevant to what's going on in some ways today um I love the costuming. I can't believe I'm even saying that, but man, the baubles and everything on Brunt's clothes. And is it Ishka? Is that how you pronounce her right. name? Her, that is some serious work that they put into those costumes. What are baubles? I've seen that around. Well, if they had uh, on Brunt's, they're, they're long things with beads on them with a bead on the end. That, that takes a lot of time. It's all handwork. I mean, how much time do they put into the costumes? Like, I'm just amazed at the work. You, most people don't think about that. I'm a doll maker. It's one of my hobbies. Not boring dolls, funky dolls, <laughs> art dolls. Funky dolls. But yeah. they, they take a long time. And I think of that, the beadwork and the Ferengi costumes in general are it's super elaborate. Yeah. Where do they get that fabric? I want to know where they shop. <laughs> do you yeah, have any well, secrets for her, Ciroc? The secret is Bob Blackman, one of the most talented uh, costume designers in the business. Um, he is just, he's just a miracle. And he gets these fabrics, he mixes them together. Like in this particular episode, Quark's uh, outfits were so elaborate i mean if you and look those at those little details, details of like little yeah. things and everything unbelievable yes yes and the, and the texture of the fabric and the the matching of the colors and patterns i just thought i actually made a note of how elaborate it was too and also moogie's moo moo uh, <laughs> was, you know was was like a cocktail dress that had all these like this this really elaborate beadwork. I love the colors and the sparkle, the sparkly to it. So um, yeah, I think her that they thing. did a fantastic job. Yeah, and her earrings, obviously the, the accessories yeah. with the earrings yeah. and, and whatnot. Um, definitely talented guy, Robert uh, Bob Blackman. Just he's the man, and when he's gonna outfit you, you're gonna get something that's never been you know seen before uh, so i have, really, have a question really for you do you have anything from the show were you allowed to keep anything i know they had a thing it was a christie's or one of those things where they sold a whole bunch of truck stuff but did, were you allowed to keep anything as a souvenir mm, no i i what? wardrobe wardrobe wise no that was the the strictest department besides the props department so 
Uh, obviously, you know, if they gave you a phaser or a, you know, some kind of uh, iPad to work with, then right as soon as they say cut, print, the props department was like, as soon as, soon as you turn around, he was right there like, give me that stuff. I need that bag. I need that tricorder or whatever it is that you're holding. So um, that was just taken away from you right away. So you didn't really have time to, you know, take it back to your trailer and play with it or maybe take it to your house. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that was, and then the wardrobe was also, you know, as soon as you, they're, they're right on your, they're right on you to get that stuff. Um, the only thing I did get, which I meant to show you guys on the last episode was in the episode Explorers that mm -hmm. we just covered before this was uh, a bunch of star maps that we use to chart the galaxy and find our way to Cardassia. And um, I took, I took one of those maps. Wow. So you still have so, it? I still have the map. Yeah, I still, I actually, I've been meaning to frame that map and put it up, but I still have it rolled up the way it was on the set. Wow. You're going to have to show us at some point. I'll have to show you guys. Yeah. Avery does not have that baseball. No, that's the one thing he was upset about because he wanted <laughs> the baseball and he was supposed to get the baseball. But Mark Alimo coming... took it, right? I don't know who took it. Somebody, <laughs> somebody took that baseball. Uh, wow. Much, much to Avery's dissatisfaction because he wanted it. Um, but I do remember Avery telling me that he has his captain's uniform, so oh. Oh. he does have that. Yeah, I think Renee it. had a he, bucket. He got away with it. Renee had a bucket. Yeah, I remember <laughs> that. It's an SCLV. He had the bucket sitting there. He said this was one of the ones from that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So Sue gives us a fun idea. For a, a good question today, thank you, Sue. Uh, thank you, Sue. <laughs> you haven't heard it. Yet. Don't thank me yet. <laughs> she, no, but the if it's a good one, is, we're in trouble. What are uh -huh. your favorite? What What's your favorite alien outfit? Whether it's a specific character or just a, a, an alien race. Um, I would throw mine out, but I can't remember what the alien race is called off the top of my head. <laughs> they were on Voyager. Anyway, I'll see if I can remember. Uh, Muhammad is still thinking. TJ knows. We're all still thinking. <laughs> What's up, TJ? Do you, do you seem like it. You seem resolute. <laughs> we not always have a standby answer, so. Uh, As Redax? Well, <laughs> yeah. But Anne Marie isn't here, so I can't throw out Bones McCoy and, and Dax to uh, frustrate her. Uh, but I'm going to say the Gorn uh, from the original series. Like, nice. um, like that outfit. It's pretty neat. As a matter of fact, I have one on order. Really? Oh, sweet. <laughs> yes. Nice. Sweet. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting that. Tim, so have TJ, a, oh, well, once you have that, TJ, maybe um, you could wear that, and I could wear my one of my Anobos uniforms. Yeah. Okay. So okay. somebody has to throw throw up a Gorn on the back on their backdrop so we can see what that, <laughs> what that looks like. I know you guys are technologically superior. <laughs> on that. I can't find. You, got, you want me to do it? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll do it. Homer, Homer can do Talk it. Yeah. My iPad, my iPad um, won't I, do it. So, <laughs> can I go can I go so it. no one steals my answer? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Trelane. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. It's a very so good choice. It's kind of like Liberace TOS for those that don't know. Right off. Um, yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to look for a Gorn. Liberace TOS. Yeah. Trelay. Um, some people refer to him as being a precursor of Q. I, I don't buy yeah. that, even though I, I roll my eyes every time I hear that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to buy that. Okay. Uh, what about Tim? Mr. Tim Baum. From uh, TNG, I think the episode was called Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Oh wow! Yes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if the, it's the one I'm thinking of, it was the wedding dress. 
at the very end. Okay. It was the episode where she bonded with the uh, uh, the card accidentally. The card. And uh, but she still had to get married to another alien. But uh, her wedding dress was stunning. Oh. But yeah, I'll have to look up exactly the name of that episode. But yes. Next, you said next generation. Yeah. And what was the character? Um. She, she was yeah. she, she was an alien. Was she that's called the metamorph, or did she have a the, name? She was the metamorph. I was. She may have had a name. I'd have to look it up. But uh, uh, was she, she the one that came out of the egg like yes thing? too that's early, <laughs> and she she bonds with the first. She knows right. It right. was humorous through the whole episode because she would change herself depending on the guy she was with. So all the guys were like following her around because she was the perfect mate. Maybe that was the name of the episode. It was called Perfect, Perfect Mate. Mate. And I think it was yeah. Fomka Jansen, wasn't it? The actress so, yeah. that played it. I think yeah. she's later on, she she was in uh, like one of the Bond movies and an X-Men movie or something like that. There it is. Yeah. There's the Gorn. There's the Gorn <laughs> outfit. <laughs> there nice. was the Gorn. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> Muhammad... Do you yeah, have we a, should do that on the cruise as well? Uh, Homer. <laughs> do you have a favorite Muhammad? I can't I was thinking of just like funny ones and things like that. So there was one from the original series, but I can't remember which episode it was from. I was I was frantically trying to Google to find it. But they had this uniform where it was just like one side was like red and one side was green. It was just it was it looked so ridiculous. It was kind of funny. So I like that. <laughs> I mean least favorite is easy. The the ones from Next Generation Justice. Yes. No. How did exactly. I know? Look at <laughs> right on cue. Look at that. Least favorite. Oh, I knew you said least favorite. I said click. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that would definitely be the least favorite, though, especially for the guy. For the women, it who's would be cosplaying the, this? Yeah, right. For the guy, that's the worst. For the women, the worst is uh, TJ. Original series. No, that's not happening. <laughs> Come uh, on, Ryan. You can pull that off. Uh, yeah, with just like. <laughs> And that guy's got a sun. He, they, this guy's got a sunburn, they, man. This poor guy's got uh, a sunburn. They did that on the cruise. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they had some people running by. Yeah, they're, they are always there are always people on the cruise yeah. running around the ship with that. Yeah. <laughs> wow! Thanks for the warning. There's, yeah. there's, the there's usually yeah. just yeah. A, like a communal groan that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sue, do you have a? Uh, a we favorite? love them too, though. They might be listening. We love them from afar. Costumes? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I can't. <laughs> I can't give you the episode or it's Deep Space Nine. I'm trying to think. It was a a man, and he, he had on a jacket that was made of like squares of different things. Sirak, does that ring a bell at all to you? I'm. I just can't remember what episode it was. It was the most bizarre compilation of things on a jacket. And I, he was in the bar. Does that ring a bell at all? He was in Cork's bar. That, that, that's mm. the one that I can say. It wasn't it was Morn. Like, it's not Morn, right? No, no, no. Okay. No, it no. was a, an yeah. alien visiting the station. No, I can't. I thought that was a pretty fantastic use of God knows what that was on that different squares of his suit jacket. Oh. I'll think of it, of course, the minute that we're done. <laughs> Luckily, you have bought me enough time to find out what the alien was. I believe it was the Herogen that I was thinking of that has like a cool outfit, cool helmets. Um, what about Harry Mudd in the original series with that cool hat? Remember he had that hat that was like bent up on one side? <laughs> or the one. Daft Punk women. one. <laughs> oh, the Daft Punk one in uh, Discovery? No, I'm talking uh, in uh, Deep Space Nine, the Breen. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> they, 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 had the, they had the I cool helmet. But, I want yeah. the refrigerator uh, for, for one in summertime. Right. Uh, uh, Daft Punk was on Picard. Yeah. Yeah, there was a few Daft Punks in there. Yeah. So, uh, Sirach, do you have a favorite? A favorite? You know, uh, I guess 
it, I look at them in different ways. Like if I was going to wear something, it's like on an everyday thing, it would not be anything that's behind you, Ryan. Um, <laughs> or my it, seat. It would actually or be. Or my seat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, Kirk in the original series had a green uh, shirt with a little bit of a gold trim on it. I really like that shirt and that style. So that's one thing that I would totally wear like right now, uh, just on like an everyday type thing. Uh, but if I had to do like a costume contest and really get dressed up and I would want to be a Borg. Nice. Oh yeah. Very nice. I yeah. I think that's pretty elaborate and their costumes are pretty amazing. I can't find it, the one that I'm even talking about. I just realized that we all failed. We should all just said Jake Cisco. <laughs> what, yeah. what are we talking yeah. about? We've got, yeah. the, we've got the pro right here. You know what? Yeah. I'll throw one out there since uh, Explorers was last week. Uh, sorry, Jake, but uh, Avery was was pretty yeah. decked out. Yeah. That episode. Right. I really liked his outfit. <laughs> yeah, his vest was sick. That that print on the vest was like an African style print. I'm pretty sure he stole it from your closet though. So uh, you know what I would have if I could have taken something uh outfit wise it would be that vest he was wearing. I love that vest in that in that episode. So I have to agree with you on that TJ. That's a it's a good call. There's a bug on my window. I was wondering if Sue could identify it. <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> try. <laughs> try. It doesn't look like it wants to be grabbed. <laughs> wow. That's confusing. It's not screaming. That's good. There it is. Can you, you have wings? Yeah. Make your screen big. Yeah, make your screen bigger. Uh, all right. I'm trying. Here we go. Make you big. Make us go. <laughs> it looks like a stink bug. Mm -hmm. Oh, stink shit. Bug. Really? <laughs> <laughs> <A stink> bug <laughs> or a shield bug. Uh, yeah. Trying your hand the other way. Yeah, nope. sh oh, the shield it bug. It's in the okay. pentatomid family. Harmless, oh. unless you're a plant. <laughs> He's going outside. You got to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Lost him. That is oh, great. back, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the window. I'll toss him out in a minute. When you said stink bug, though, I was like, all right, he's going out right Fuck, now. Out <laughs> no, they don't really. Well, bring, everybody bring your bugs next week. We're going to do it. <laughs> That's easy Two for me. Bugs. I've got a ton downstairs. <laughs> what do you have? You have really cool fruit bugs. Flies. Every day I collect fruit flies in my backyard for my research. So I have like a ton of them sitting down there waiting. Oh, okay. Lucky. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah. that was fun. A little bit of bugs, a lot of wardrobes. <laughs> I'm looking through wardrobe pictures. Yeah. <laughs> We've got we've um, got forty seconds left. What do you got, Homer? Well, it's really quick. So, if you talk to J.G. Hertzler, you can ask him about the Herogen costume because he played a Herogen in Voyager. Excellent knowledge. Homer's oh. the man. He also <laughs> played a Vulcan captain in Emissary, first episode of Deep Space Nine. Yes. He was Cisco's captain. J.G. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's, he's, uh, he must be up there on the list of uh, most appearances in uh, Star Trek episodes. Mm -hmm. He's got to be up there with. I mean, he's on lower decks now, too. You're right. Yeah. That's another one. He's got to be. He's got to be up there. Mm -hmm. Him and uh, Jeff Combs and, yeah. and, and, and the gang. I think it's Von Armstrong that's in first. Von, or, Von Armstrong. To first. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Vaughn's yeah, done. Vaughn plays that little guitar a lot. He loves bringing. The <laughs> yeah, no. you know what I mean. Every time I see Vaughn, he's got his little, his little. I don't know what kind of guitar it is, but it's a tiny one. Ukulele. Yeah. It's it's kind of like a ukulele, but it's not. It's something else. Oh, he's, he's, is it a mandolin? And that's what I was gonna say. I think it, I think that's what it is. Yeah, and he likes to play that, so he brings it with him on conventions, and you'll <laughs> see him in in the car playing it. It's pretty. It's pretty fun. <laughs> All right. Yeah. 
Love mandolins, it. bugs, and clothing. <laughs> but we got to run here. Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining us at home. And thank you, very special thanks to Muhammad Noor, TJ Jackson Bay, Timothy Baum, Susan V. Gruner, Homer Frizzell, Sirach Lofton, and I would like to say thank you very much. And we'll see you next time on Seventh Rule. No, wait. I, what I meant to say was always remember the Seventh Rule. Yeah. There you go.